Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. Guys, uh, today I'm going to share with you a new tool that I just recently acquired. It's something I've actually been on the lookout for for a really long time, and uh, these are hard to come by. And what you're looking at here is what is often called a rapido meter. And it's used for checking uh, local area flatness on pretty much anything, but the main thing and the main thing I want to use it for is to be able to check surface plates. Uh, and this is one of two different processes that is used in calibrating or checking the overall flatness of a surface plate and determining what grade that surface plate uh, goes into. So let me zoom you in here, show you this one. This one is a little bit unique, a little bit special, and I'm really excited to have it. So let's take a closer look at this Rapido meter here and talk a little bit about it. So first off, this tool uh, was a specialty tool that's used primarily in surface plate calibration and calibrating anything that you really want to check for, for flatness. Uh, it's a comparator tool. It does not really map something out, but it kind of compares one area of the plate to another. And it is a very useful tool and it is a, a part of a two-part process in calibrating, calibrating a surface plate. And we're going to talk more about that here in just a little bit. Now, this tool was originally built by a company named Ron. Uh, they, I think they're the ones that pretty much designed it, or at least are the ones that sold and, and made the, the most of them that you see out there. Uh, Ron no longer sells this. I believe they sold the rights to Starrett. Starrett now actually has a version of this. It looks very similar. It's a little bit different. Uh, a new one of these, if you go buy a new one from Starrett, it's about $2,000 just for the body. That's not even counting the actual indicator up here that you read on. Why they're so expensive, I really don't know and don't understand, but they are. And uh, they are a specialty tool. You don't really see a whole lot of these in the used market. And when they do show up, say, on eBay or someplace like that, they tend to go for big money. I've been looking for one of these for actually probably about a year and a half, two years now. And they rarely come up for sale. And when they do, again, uh, they go for big money because people who are in the calibration business need this tool. And uh, they're willing to pay big money for one because they rarely come up and they don't want to have to go buy a brand spanking new one. So what does it, what does it do? So if the, there's an indicator up here. This is a special indicator. Uh, it is a very precision indicator. Each individual line on this uh, dial here is 20 millionths of an inch. So each number on here is basically a tenth of a uh, ten thousandth of an inch. So, um, you know, from zero all the way down here to one, that's one thousandth of an inch. So basically it has a two thousandths of an inch uh, range from, from one end to the other. You zero it in the center. And like I said, each, uh, that's, point, that's a tenth of a thousandth. And then each individual line in there is 20 millionths of an inch. So it's capable of measuring something extremely at precision levels. And uh, basically the way it works, I'm going to flip it over on its side. There are some contact points on the bottom. So there's three contact points in the back. You got a lot of extra weight back here to kind of hold this down. So it's riding on these three points at all time. There's a flexure in here. This is where it actually allows this rod, this front part, to bend ever so slightly. Uh, it is deflecting. And you got a single point up here in the front. This is a known distance between these. And from this, basically, you can tell how much this front end is moving up and down compared to the back end back here. And again, we use this for checking comparative flatness on a surface plate. Um, I'm going to move this around a little bit. And you, you adjust this knob right here, you can adjust that zero. This is really, really ticky because just a little bitty tiny move on this, as you can imagine, will move that a long way. But um, let me just kind of move it forward and you can kind of see that dial moving around. And what that is telling you is, is that there are some slight differences in flatness of the plate. And I happen to know this is one of the worst areas in the plate. So this is uh, uh, really kind of showing that. In fact, there's about a tenth of a thousandth uh, difference right here. And this is by far the worst spot on my plate. There's a hole right here. What this is telling me is that there is a small hole in this plate. And when I say a hole, it's a ten thousandth of an inch deep. 
So one tenth of a thousandth of an inch deep. It's, it's, it's not a big hole, but in surface plate world, that's, that's a big, that's, that is a big hole. So that's kind of how it works, what it is. Uh, let me tell you the story about this particular one. So like I just said, I've been looking for one of these tools for quite some time. And actually, I've, I really first became aware of this tool about four years ago when we had the very first scraping class at my shop, Richard King scraping class. And um, at that sh particular class, we had a, uh, one of the people that came in, he brought a rapido meter and we were actually looking at some of the surface plates. This was before I'd ever had a surface plate check, before I really even knew how you went around the calibration of one. And I just said, that is the neatest tool. And now that I'm kind of starting to want to do my own inspection and do my own resurfacing of plates, this is a tool that I really need to have in the arsenal to be able to do that. And it's also a handy tool. If I ever go out and I'm looking at a surface plate at an auction or a sale and I want to get a quick idea of how far out of calibration that plate may be. Again, this will not tell me the whole story, but if it's got a huge swing in movement on this dial that tells me that, hey, this plate is probably in need of a lot of work. If I run it around the plate and it's, it's fairly, you know, if I can keep it within a tenth or maybe a tenth and a half, you know, that tells me, okay, this plate's probably in pretty good shape to start with. Um, so that's the reason, kind of the reason why I've been wanting to have one. Look for one, like I said, I've been looking for one pretty hard for about a year and a half now. I've seen them come up, but not at a price I was willing to pay. And I finally just decided, you know what, forget it. I'm just going to make one. Uh, this is not that difficult to make one of these things. Yes, it takes some work, but hey, I'm a machinist. I can build one of these things. And I know that my friend John Saunders at NYC CNC, he actually came to that very first scraping class. And when he left my class and went home, he thought the same thing. He's going to make one. He made a repeat meter He more or less copied the run. He made a few changes to it. Uh, Tom Lipton got involved in it over Knox Tools, and they kind of made a few little uh, design improvements. And John did a, a couple of videos where he went through how to make a repeat meter I reached out to John. I said, John, uh, I knew that he had modeled this up in Fusion 360, so he had it all in CAD. I said, instead of me trying to basically copy one without having one in my hands, if I could get those files from John, I would be miles ahead and I could have something to start with working on mine. Uh, but John, John said, well, instead of building one, why don't I just sell you the one I got? So he built this and, and honestly, he hasn't really used it since he made the video series on it. So John actually sold me the one that he built uh, the, the collaboration between himself and Ox Tools. He made me a really good deal on it, uh, and it was definitely within my price range of what I could afford, and here it is. So there's kind of my story. So down in the description of my video, I'm actually going to put some links over to some of the series that were done between uh, John Saunders and, and uh, Tom Lipton at Ox Tools. Uh, John kind of originally drew up the original version. He sent the, the blueprints to, to Tom. Tom made some design critiques. Uh, John kind of uh, took some of those to heart and made some design changes to it, minor changes, but kind of made, made the manufacturing process a little bit easier. And uh, over a course of videos, he, he machined this out using some of his CNC tools, uh, CNC milling machines primarily. And like I said, this is the one we got. And if you look here on the top, it actually has the uh, Saunders Machine Works and Ox Tool logo in the top, which even makes it a little bit more special for me because uh, I consider both John and Tom Lipton to be friends and uh, to have a, a, a tool that they collaborated on designing uh, in my shop. It is a, I think it's a one of a kind. Uh, I'm really excited to have this. So let's talk a little bit more about the process of calibrating a surface plate or checking the calibration of a surface plate to see how flat that surface plate actually is. And to do that, again, I talked a while ago, it's a two-step process. The first step is to kind of map the plate out and look for the changes in height and elevation as it moves along. And to do that, you need to use a tool such as this auto collimator. Now, I've talked about the auto collimator in videos before, but basically what it is doing, it is measuring changes in an angle as you move a 
apart across this plate. And it's measuring very accurate, very tiny changes in angle. So basically this is a telescope looking tool. You look down into this eyepiece and you can see some lines in there. I wish I could get a shot down that so you could see it, but unfortunately my camera just won't do it. But when you look down in there, um, what you're looking at or what way this instrument works is you got a light source that goes through this. This light source goes through some special uh, lenses that collimate the light. So normally when you have a light beam that's going out, it kind of goes out at an angle. So if you take a flashlight and you shine it up against the wall, you know, one foot in front of the flashlight, the, the circle of light is about this big. If you go 10 feet, you know, the circle of light gets bigger. Uh, going through some lenses, what it does is it changes that light beam. So that the light beams are parallel to one another. They're perfectly parallel. And it shines that light through uh, the front of this into a mirror. The mirror reflects the light beams back. It actually has a line in there that, that moves up and down that you can adjust over here to make your measurement with. And you can measure basically how the angle. So this mirror here, when it's sitting on the plate, uh, it's, it's gonna be sitting at an angle to that light beam. And this instrument is capable of measuring uh, degrees of a circle in arc seconds, which is a very, very tiny difference. And, and basically what you do is that you move this mirror from one position to another in different stations. It measures that change in angle of the, of the, the mirror sitting on three feet on the plate. So it's measuring its change in angle. So, and when I talk about an arc second, I want you to understand what an arc second is because that's really important to the math and how all this is done. Well guys, I'm getting over here in front of the whiteboard. So that's usually a sign that we're about to get down into the weeds. And if you don't want to go in the weeds, you can skip ahead a little bit and uh, just continue on the video. But I think it is important that you understand this concept of arc seconds. So let's see, I got a marker here that works. So let's talk about where, where do we normally see arc seconds in use? And if you do anything with a GPS, you know that a lot of times we talk about um, coordinates in degrees, minutes, and seconds. So you'll have, say, uh, you know, 180 degrees, 45 minutes, 32 seconds. And that would be a coordinate on the Earth. And they're using basically um, angles to tell you what this is. So let's talk about degrees first. And I think most people know this, but you have a circle and a circle is divided into 360 degrees. So 0, 90, 180, 270, and zero is also 360. So each one of these are degrees. So, you know, between this, we divide this into 360 equal increments. So one degree equals one 360th of a circle, okay? So one degree is just a little bitty tiny sliver in there. Now within that degree, I'm gonna draw a degree here and we're gonna kinda, this is one degree. That's a very long distance here, but this is divided into 60 se segments. Each one of those 60 segments is one minute, one minute. So one minute equals one sixtieth of a degree or one, I'm gonna write it up here, one minute equals, this is a big fraction here, one twenty-one thousand six hundredth of a circle. So a minute is a very, very tiny segment of that circle. So one degree again divided into 60 segments and that's going to be one minute. Now we can do the same thing for one minute. Again, we have an angle uh, and that one minute is again divided into 60 increments. Each one of these increments is one second or arc second. It's usually 
indicated like this. So one second. So you'd be one sixtieth of that. So you do the math. It is one. Let's see. What is it? One million two hundred ninety-six thousand of a circle. So basically an arc second is a very, very, very tiny portion of a circle. So to kind of illustrate how small an arc second is, I'm going to take a tennis ball, okay? I can't remember what this is. I checked the dimension earlier when I was doing my math. But let's say that we have a one arc second angle and we wanted to basically put that angle at a distance away from this where it hit the top and the bottom of this. So we got a, uh, an angle that does like this and we have that tennis ball, this little bitty tennis ball in here. If this is one arc second down here, how far away would this have to be? And the answer to that is, okay, you ready for this? 8.3 miles or for you metric guys, 13.4 kilometers away, okay? So when I say that I'm measuring with my auto collimator, and it's capable of measuring to a tenth of an arc second, that's the kind of, uh, that's the kind of distances we're talking about. That's kind of uh, measurements that we're talking about here. And, and to give it another way, you know, let's, uh, let's, uh, Let's put it into something more machinist terms. Let's, let's say that we have a, something that's five inches apart. We have two points that are five inches apart. One arc second, so, and you can think of this as that mirror sled going across your surface plate. If, if the feet on there are five inches apart, one arc second would make, uh, would basically be that this height difference over five inches would be about 25 millionths of an inch, 25 millionths of an inch. One arc second is equal to about 25 millionths of, in, of an inch over five inches. So that's how we're measuring with that sled, uh, with that mirror as it goes across the plate. We're actually kind of using, you can use Pythagoras theorem, you can use your, your uh, basic trigonometry to figure out the math here uh, based on those, those measurements. And again, uh, this is one arc second. That auto collimator is capable of measuring down to a tenth of an arc second. So a couple of months ago, I actually used my auto collimator to map out my plate and to actually do a calibration, or at least the part of the calibration to look at the overall flatness from one to the other, basically find the highest and lowest points on this plate and get an idea of how flat it was. Now, I didn't do it on camera. Uh, there's been several guys who've done videos on how to do this, and uh, but again, we take the auto collimator, we slide the sled, I measure here, I think this is three inch increments, so I, I check this, and we run multiple lines. There's kind of a, a union jack pattern. Uh, you run three long lines to the table, one on the, each end, one down the center. You run three lines in this direction down the table, one on each end and one the, in the center, and then you run two diagonals. And when you do this, you have all these different points where these lines intersect. So they intersect here and here. They intersect in the, here you got two. In the center, you've actually got uh, four lines that intersect. Uh, and then you got two lines on the other points around there. And by doing some pretty fancy mathematics and, and, and mapping the, the change in the angle as you go across this plate, it will basically calculate a line that shows the differences. When I shot my ways on my auto collimator, that's what we did in our on my metal planer, we shot the ways on the metal planer with the auto collimator, we were able to map out the ups and downs and very, very tiny differences uh, on there. And, and that's basically what we're doing. We're, we're running these different lines and then we take all those lines and we look at where they join, where those corners join, and that can give us a 3D representation of what the surface of the plate looks like. Now, I did it with an auto collimator, uh, Lance Balsley. Uh, if you watched, I think Adam Booth had a video just a week or so ago from when we were down at John Terry's and he was showing using electronic level. Levels. The electronic levels, it's a different instrument, but it does the exact same thing 
that this auto collimator is doing. You've, that level is sitting on feet that are so far apart, and it's measuring very precisely changes in angles as it goes across the plate. So you're getting the exact same measurement that the auto collimator is doing, but with the electronic levels, it's just a different instrument to do it with. There's also a laser instrument. It does the same thing. It, changes, it gives you those changes in angles as it goes across the plate. Now, the advantage of the electronic levels over the auto collimator basically is faster. Um, it's, it's really easy to go through there. You're not looking through here and having to decipher a line. It's just giving you a readout of a number. And the really cool thing about it is, is it's actually connected to the software. So all Lance has to do is push a button. It records that number. He can shoot a plate in probably about one-tenth of the time that at least it takes me to shoot the plate with the auto collimator uh, just because it's a lot faster. Theoretically, the auto collimator is probably more accurate than the electronic levels, uh, but you know, both instruments are capable of measuring to a tenth of an arc second. And honestly, for shooting a, a, a surface plate, if you can get it down to the closest arc second, you're gonna be plenty accurate enough. I mean, this thing is just crazy, crazy accurate, both of them are, so they're both fine. The lasers, uh, I think most people say the lasers are probably a little bit more accurate than the auto collimators, but again, the level of accuracy that we're talking about, it, it probably doesn't really matter. So let me show you what, I, what the numbers that I got when I, I shot my plate with the auto collimator. So when I shot all these numbers, I used the software package that's uh, out there from Vermont Photonics. They actually sell some metrology equipment and you can go to their website. You can download a demo version of their software for free. Uh, if you want to purchase the, the, the software, the only difference between the free version and the version that you can purchase is you can save these numbers, save the plates in the software when basically in the free version, you can put all the numbers in and make all the calculations, but you can't save them. So if you want to go pull it back up again, you'd have to manually type all these numbers in. I took screenshots so that I could show you the software and kind of have a record of it. But this is how we set it up. You know, my plate is basically 72 inches by 36 inches. Uh, we determine the distance between the feet. It actually will calculate in here someplace else and tell you what the ideal distance between those feet are for that specific plate. And uh, we just went with three inches, which was real close to whatever that number was. And I can't remember what it calculated it to be. This is that Union Jack pattern that I was talking about. We have these different points. They're like, you know, we shoot line A, C, A, G, so forth like that. But again, you would shoot each one of these lines, A, C, uh, H, D, G, E, uh, E, C, or I guess it would have been C, E, B, F, A, G, and then you do the diagonals, uh, which is uh, A, E, and GC. So all those different lines, you shoot each one of them individually and you put the numbers into the software. This is kind of just scrolling down the page and you can see I put my numbers in. Basically we started at zero. I zeroed out my auto collimator on the first reading and then each one of these numbers is showing the change in angle of that mirror going across that plate and this is in arc seconds. So, you know, each one of them is basically starting from that zero. How's it changing? Each increment, again, we're moving it three inches and from that it can calculate the individual lines. And um, I'm going to show this one. This is kind of a um, kind of a busy slide, but each one of these lines represents a, each one of the individual lines that I shoot on there. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, when we look at these, the, the, the change in here, this is extremely exaggerated, okay? So basically from, you know, we're, the whole scale on here is uh, from the lowest point to the high point is, this is in micro inches. So this is basically, 5.3 ten thousandths of an inch. So very small differences. And that was kind of the, the total, the maximum error I had on my plate from the lowest point to the highest point was uh, 538 micro inches. Or again, when you uh, draw that out, that's, uh, I'll tell you what, let me, let me write it out so you can see it. So 538 micro inches will be zero, 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 
five, three, eight inches. Very, very small number. Again, extremely exaggerated. And uh, using the, the software to kind of combine those lines and put them all together, it will give you a 3D representation of what the surface of that plate looks like. And again, these heights on here are greatly exaggerated uh, because if you were to just look at it in normal mode, it'd, it'd look flat. Uh, so, you know, from our lowest point, which was right here, to our highest point, which was, um, I think, somewhere over in here, a little over half a thousandth of an inch. Not a whole lot. So this is how my plate looked. And this is before doing any lapping. This is before, this is basically as my plate arrived in my shop, or at least as it was on that day that I did it. How does that, what does those numbers look like? This is just a, a cheat sheet here to kind of tell you uh, how different things grade. So you, you look on here for your, the size plate that you have. I found this off the internet. I've got a 36 inch by 72 inch um, plate. And when you look at total flatness, it's got this in, uh, in both inches and millimeters. But to be a grade double A, you know, we would have to have that maximum flatness number under three tenths. Again, we were just a little over five tenths. That's for grade double A. For grade A, again, 36 by 72, it has to be under six tenths of an inch. So in my case, it was what, 5.3 or 530 here. So, you know, this plate would grade an, an A, which is actually pretty darn good, particularly for a used plate. It would grade A based on total flatness. So grade B, we'd have to have it under 1.2 thousandths of an inch. Uh, if it was, you know, under that number, it would grade B. So there's a pretty big difference, basically twice. Each one of these is like twice the accuracy. So three tenths, six tenths, 12 tenths of an inch. So it doubles each time. So my plate based on overall flatness would grade an A as it stands right now. We're gonna lap this at some point in the future and uh, hopefully get it back down to this double A standard. Uh, I don't think it's gonna take a whole lot of work to get it there. We're actually pretty close already. So using the precision levels or auto collimator to check your plate for overall flatness using the Moody method, using that union jack layout pattern, that is step one of calibration. But you're not done when you get there. It gives you an overall picture, but it is somewhat of a rough picture because we only run those, that, those feet in certain areas of the plate. And there's areas of the plate in between here where we're not inspecting. That's where the repeatometer comes into play. And what we're able to do with this, and again, this is not really, you can't tell what the height difference is from this side of the plate to that side of the plate. We use the Moody method, we use the levels for that. But this can compare, okay, how does the plate look from here? You know, we, we know these two points here were lines, but how does it, how does it look in between? And we can run this repeatometer through there and looking at the gauge on there, that kind of gives us another look at what the flatness is. It's looking at small areas in the plate to see if there's a, a little small hole. Because there very well be, could be that the person that was working on this plate, let's say he had a height gauge that's set right here, which is in the area that we didn't check, and he was constantly moving that height gauge around that one little spot over and over and over again, and over time it's gonna wear right here. This may be an area that we didn't actually check with the, the, the levels. So that's where the repeatometer comes in. So whenever you get through or before or whatever, the idea here is, is that you take this repeatometer and you run it up and down the plate. You just kind of go up and down and you look at everything in here. You can do this fairly fast. You're just kind of looking for how much that needle moves in there and you're kind of looking for a low and a high. Typically you're gonna run it in multiple directions. So I'm gonna run it in this direction and uh, I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to run it from the other direction uh, because it's going to come out farther on the ends. I'm going to run it diagonally. So I'm going to take some time, and, and, and it's literally as fast as what I'm doing right now. You can watch that needle move on there, and you just kind of mentally say, okay, where's my high, where's my low, and what's the, the total height difference in there? When I did that on this plate, basically we saw one-tenth of a thousandth on here. So again, on that meter, on that line, let me zoom you in there. 
So rehashing here, you know, from zero to one, that is one thousandth of an inch. The point one, point two, point three, those are ten thousandths of an inch, so a tenth of a thousandth. Each individual line on the indicator is 20 millionths of an inch. So again, extremely accurate. When I ran this across the table, off across my plate, basically I went from where I'm at zero to about point one. So I've got about a tenth of a thousandth differences in local height through here. And again, we had about five tenths. So, you know, if I was able to have, look at the total, it went, would have gone, you know, for a little, between five and six was a total, you know, from, from over the entire plate. But I'm looking at small areas here. So again, we move this around and we watch that needle move. It doesn't move very much. Now, in the case of my plate, uh, a, a tenth of a thousandth, that would actually put me at a grade B uh, over the local uh, flatness. To be a grade um, uh, A, I think it's uh, you have to be under 80 millionths, and to be a grade double A, you have to be under 60 millionths of an inch. Uh, I am confident there was some lapping. Probably the very little lapping will get the repeatability where it needs to be. Uh, we'll have to probably do a little bit more lapping to get that half thousandth out over the entire plate. So there you go. Probably a lot more than you ever really want to know about a repeatometer. <laughs> I know I got down in the weeds here, guys, and, and, and the truth of the matter is, is that we just barely touch the top of the weeds. Uh, there's some really good videos out on YouTube about surface plate calibration that you can look at. Uh, if you really want to get down into the technical stuff, go check out Robin Renzetti. Uh, he's got a couple of um, videos where he has been redoing his surface plate. And I'm going to tell you, uh, if, you know, the, if you really want to nerd out on accuracy, go listen to, to Robin. Uh, but you'll learn something. I promise you will. Robin actually built his on repeato meter. It is totally different from the one I've got here. It actually has an electronic um, uh, indicator on it. Uh, it. But at the end of the day, it basically does the same thing as this one does. It's just a little bit different take on it. Uh, but again, if you really want to learn about surface plate calibration and really get down in the weeds on some of this stuff, go check out Robin's channel. Um, there's been several other guys that have done surface plate calibration videos. Uh, Tom Lipton over at Ox Tools actually had Stanridge Granite come out and do some of their plates, and uh, they talked about the process. I actually got to visit Stanridge Granite when I was out at the Bargy Summer Bash a couple of years ago. got to tour their plant and uh, really talked to them. I learned a heck of a lot about surface plate calibration when I was there. Uh, and guys, I I'm just scratching the surface. I will say that uh, my buddy Lance Botsley, who has got some laps, is gonna come up and we're gonna actually lap my plate in at some point in the near future. Uh, he had a gentleman who's been in the surface plate calibration and, and resurfacing business for quite some time, come down to his shop on two different occasions and kind of give him some lessons on how to do it and really talk about the process and actually using the laps and I'm fortunate that I got to go down both times and hang out with Lance and this gentleman and so I really kind of have gotten some instruction on how to properly lap uh, a surface plate and I'm anxious to get in here and do mine. I don't have a lap right now. Uh, I would love to get a cast iron plate that I can uh, scrape in and basically have my own lap. And to, to lap a plate, you just have a really flat surface. So, so use a cast iron surface plate with some diamond uh, grit on it. It's basically like sandpaper. Uh, very fine sandpaper and you rub that around on the top of this uh, larger plate and there's an art to it. It's just if you go in here and just start doing it, you'll screw a plate up in a hurry, but there's a process and by using that flat plate and hitting the high spots on here, we can flatten this plate out and, uh, and really get it down where it needs to be. And like I said, I don't think it's going to take a whole lot to, to get this one back into double A spec. So there you go, uh, there's my new toy, my Rapido meter. Big thank you to John Saunders over at NYC CNC Saunders Machine Works uh, for offering this to me. Like I said, he had it, he basically built it, didn't have a need for it, said he's never used it and wanted to pass it along to me where we could uh, really use this tool. And this is something that, I'm not, it's not something I use, you know, every day, 
but uh, when I check my plate, you need to check your plate on average once a year. Uh, and I've got the equipment now that I can at least check my plates for calibration between the repeatometer and my auto collimator. And uh, with a lap, I can even tune up my own plate. So uh, I'm really excited about that. Thanks, John, for letting me, uh, give me a great deal on this thing. And uh, there you go, more than you wanted to know probably uh, less than you wanted to know if you're actually going to try to attempt this yourself. Guys, that will be a wrap as always. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you made it this far, you're probably a nerd, uh, but hey, so am I. So we're, we're, we, we're birds of a feather here. Guys, we'll talk to you next time around. Thanks for watching.